ITS. Ada yang dosen ya kan pakai Parida tuh kan dosen. Iya. Baik, Bapak Ibu ini 16.30 kita mulai nggih. Eh uh, silakan untuk start live YouTube. So, Profesor, we will start uh, today session. So you can uh, unmute. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. My name is Raras, and I will be the moderator for today's session. We are welcoming all the participants from uh, today's adjunct professor, Foundation of Internet of Things. Uh, this is held by Department of Information Systems, Faculty of Intelligent Electrical and Informatics Technology, Institute Technology, 10 November. I would like to uh, welcome Professor Cho. Hello. Thank you for coming. Okay. And then we have uh, Prof. Erma Suryani as the coordinator for this adjunct professor. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Buraras. Yeah. And yes, welcome to all the participants. We have uh, around 180. We have participants registered uh, 260. So really, really a massive uh, attention. Thank you for that. Mostly we have from information system department, the bachelor and the master program. We also have from information technology departments, uh, welcome. And then we have from computer engineering department, uh, welcome. And also all of you uh, from uh, other universities also uh, welcome to these adjunct professors. Right. And then uh, I would like to show the class rule. So we have a little bit class rule here. So please uh, use your full name in the Zoom meeting so that you know it's other. And then you can fill the presents uh, for today. Uh, that is the link. So perhaps uh, that is too small. So we will share it in the chat Zooms. So in tip.in slash presency adjunct professor Uh, DSE one. This is the first lecture, and we will have six uh, classes every Thursday in the same time. If you have questions, please you can raise your hand or write in the chat Zoom, and then I can uh, read the question to Professor for you. And there will be certificates uh, for all of you who join all the six classes. You will get certificates of attendance. And there is a final assessment. And for you who pass the assessment, then you also get the uh, another certificate for passing the course. That is a little bit for the classroom. And yes, ITS are really proud to have this adjunct professor program in 2021. We have several aims uh, to activate an international academic atmosphere in the ITS environment, to activate the culture of international publication, increase the number of ITS international lecturers, and also hopefully increase the ITS reputation in the world. And this is the schedule for today. So we uh, started on time at uh, 3.30. And then uh, we already have the opening speech from the head of our information system department earlier, Dr. Mujahidin STMT. And uh, now I would like to give the time to Professor Erma Suryani, STMT PhD for giving opening speech. Uh, for today's action professor. Oke, okay. thank you Bu Raras. Ya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Ya. Yeah. Professor Cho, ya. Yeah. And Pak Mujahidin, Bu Raras and all the team of adjunct professor and also everyone uh, that can uh, join this program. Ya. Yeah. On behalf of our department, ya, yeah, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to Professor Cho yeah, for your support and help so that we can conduct the adjunct professor today. This program is designed to uh, provide yeah, international learning and international learning for 
uh, staff and also for the students. Yeah. And also the title of this program is about Internet of Things Enable Services, which will be held in six meetings. Yeah. Uh, it will be held every Thursday, start at 3.15. We hope that this program will bring benefit for all of us. And also we hope that uh, all of us can enjoy this lecture. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cho, Pak Mujahidin, Buraras, and the team, and everyone. Yeah. For the next, I will give uh, an opportunity for Buraras to deliver the curriculum vitae of Professor Cho. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Erma Suryani. <laughs> Right, so uh, I would like to read about uh, what is Internet of Things. Uh, that will be in the next slides. So Internet of Things connects the digital and physical worlds by collecting, measuring, and analyzing data to predict and automate business process. IoT increases productivity and makes our life in general more convenient and efficient. Connected device and machines automatically capture relevant data from their environment and supply analysis. Users and enterprise thereby obtain new information, save time, and cut costs. Device automatically perform many tasks from turning the heating or lights in the smart home on and off to in-time production of goods in Industry 4.0. In the future, more and more devices and machines will be connected. 5G, the next generation of mobile telecommunications and advance in artificial intelligence will surely boost the IoT. As a result, companies will be able to develop new and improved products and the everyday life of many users will be more convenient and safer. So this is an interesting topic uh, for the young professors. Let me read uh, the curriculum vitae. Uh, so Professor Cho Suo Yen, he is the Distinguished Professor and Director of Center for Internet of Things Innovation. And he got this uh, PhD from the University of Michigan, USA, Industrial and Operations Engineering. Currently, he is a Distinguished Professor from Department of Industrial Management and TUST and also the member of the Investment Review Committee and National Development Fund, Executive Yuan. Previously, he is the Dean Office of International Affairs and TUST. He's also a visiting professor in several university, MIT, Alto, ETH, Hanyang University, Peking, Nagoya, SKUST, and University of Washington. And the courses he delivers are supply chain management, product design and development, introduction to industry 4.0, engineering economy. He has a uh, varied research interest. There are Internet of Things innovations, industrial Internet of Things, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, smart city applications. Uh, there are some students uh, come from courses smart city and then blockchain application, intelligence transportation systems, entrepreneurship, decision theory, digital manufacture, and computational geometry. Right, without further ado, I would like to give the time to Professor Cho. The time is yours. Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction. Let me switch the, uh, the PPT. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so first of all, I still want to uh, uh, thanks uh, all of you giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, the research that I have been conducting over the past, I think, 13 or 14 years, uh, starting from IFID until um, uh, uh, we, we moved from RFID to uh, Internet of Things. And recently, I also did a lot of work connecting IoT with blockchain and artificial intelligence. So um, uh, for this, uh, this coming uh, 
six weeks, uh, I will focus more on IoT because I think that IoT is a, a, a very disruptive technologies helping us to manage our physical world better. I think uh, Rara has put it very well, uh, connecting physical world with, with digital world. Uh, that's exact, what exactly IoT can do. And we all know and we all feel um, clearly how powerful the digital, digital world is, is right now. So if we can connect physical world to the digital world, we will be able to explore all kinds of uh, applications and helping us to manage our physical world better. And of course, the, other than IoT, I think uh, blockchain also concerned about connectivity. I will also spend some time talking about blockchain. Um, over the past two years, I also uh, organized two um, courses on blockchain uh, on campus. Um, I think um, a recent development of blockchain, although it looks um, dimming right now because of the, the fall of crypto uh, currency values, but I think blockchain is not just uh, cryptocurrencies. It is also uh, a different kind, kind of connectivity. Uh, I will try to share with you my view. Of course, it's a big area. Uh, hopefully that we can also spend some time discussing the potential uh, utilization of blockchain. Um, IoT is an infrastructure. If we don't have the ability to analyze the data we collect, from the physical world, I think data will still be data. Data will not be information directly, will not be uh, knowledge or even wisdom um, without processing. And recently, uh, the uh, development of AI, particularly, I think I will focus more on the, uh, how deep learning uh, influence a lot of industry. I will focus that part as well. Um, in, in this uh, particular lecture so that IoT as a platform, but in the end, IoT should still provide value to the society so that the investment or the development of IoT makes sense. Uh, I'm currently uh, serving as director of Center for IoT Innovation, and I'm also ser serving as the director for uh, blockchain research uh, at NTUST. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, 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 that many uh, activities right now for blockchain on campus, uh, because if it's more financially related, um, I think it's more of the, for the commercial purposes rather than for research purpose. So we don't have that much uh, blockchain activities on campus but it is still an area which I feel that we all need to know and or we all can make contribution by participating in this uh, blockchain development. Uh, I'm also serving as co-director of cyber physical system innovation. Uh, it is a center jointly with uh, two other professors uh, on campus. One is from electrical engineering, one is from mechanical engineering. So you can probably uh, feel that what we are trying to do, we are trying to get this cross-disciplinary expertise on uh, empowering physical world, okay? So uh, uh, since I just saw the uh, agenda by, by Raras, I, I think uh, based on the agenda, I will lecture until uh, your time, 4.50 and I will open the floor for, for the students um, or, or anybody uh, to, to ask questions. And as Rara said that you can text the message to her and she will probably consolidate those questions and post a question for you. Okay, I will, will uh, um, yeah, because uh, there are too many people. So <laughs> it's hard to say that, uh, uh, if you have any question, just raise your hand. I think that would be quite difficult to do. So I will try to uh, explain as, as clearly as, as possible, then allow 
around uh, 30 minutes, I think um, should be quite sufficient for, for our interaction. So in the beginning, I also want to uh, uh, bring your attention on how the uh, physical world change, the behavior in the physical world change. Here is a photo, okay? Uh, well, probably it's hard for you to guess. Um, it's it's in, uh, in Italy, it's in, uh, you know that in, in Catholic, they select a Pope after the previous Pope's uh, either retire or a lot of cases pass away. So these are the people waiting outside the cathedral and waiting to see the smoke coming out with a different color, meaning that they have a consensus and a new Pope uh, has been selected. So in 2005, when people are less connected, at least they are not connected mobily. So this is their behavior. They were just standing out there and waiting to see uh, and to, to also e experience the, uh, the moment. But in 2013, you can see that everybody take out their smartphone. Uh, they try to record the, the history. They have the, the power of recording the history. So everybody is having their mobile devices sitting outside and, and trying to wait. Similarly, 2006, this is in the US. This is, uh, I think maybe it was Secretary Clinton or I'm not sure, maybe at that time she was uh, the sen a, a senator. But I see people rushing to her and trying to get her signature. And I think you can probably imagine that now very few people do this, right? Even you would not do this. And this is how people will do. Now, they do selfie and taking themselves, although their face may be distorted, but their selfie with the, uh, the person they want to include in the uh, picture, uh, that will be satisfactory. So, so, so uh, over time, with the technologies, people's behavior also changes. And technology not only um, support and and Im impact our behavior. In fact, it, it guide our be behavior in some sense. We'll come to this point too. I think in some sense, it's also quite, quite scary. Uh, particularly, you think that all of the information that we get nowadays are from our mobile devices. So what if the information being distorted? I think it not no not only will influence our judgment, it will also influence even our value system. Okay. And this is another uh, situation that uh, occurred probably some years ago. I don't remember the exact year. Let me show you the behavior of the people. This is in Taipei. Uh, for those of you who were in Taiwan, this is in Beitou. Beitou area. These are like random people. They're running on the street towards something. They didn't look scared. So it's not uh, running away from something. They are running approach something. Something uh, attract them to run. And with so many people, they still go. What do you think? I think uh, for some of you are playing video game, uh, playing uh, mobile games, you probably know that this is Pokemon Go. These are virtual games, like virtual entity in your mobile. And it appeared that it, it appeared to show up at a certain place, but it's not real. But you have to go there to get this virtual object. So virtual world are guiding the behavior of the people in the physical world. 
and there are a lot of such kind of activities happening right now. Uh, younger people live more in the digital world, and the the lives in digital world maybe even satisfy them, maybe guide them to do different kind of things, maybe uh, or um, more positivity, maybe provide them um, everything that they need to know, everything that they need to enjoy. And if we say that digital world is not is not real. It's hard to say. The border is really uh, uh, thinner and thinner. And not only we we live in the digital world. Now, in fact, we have the opportunity to connect physical world to the digital world, so that we can observe the behavior of the physical world and trying to model the digital uh, physical world and maybe even give a simulate. Uh, different events in the physical world and try to devise better decision and different strategy coping with the problem in the physical world. Okay, so physical world and digital world are connected closer and closer. And it's for, for older people like me, this, this the world, virtual world is a virtual world. It's, to me, it's still not very real. But for younger generation grew up in this kind of uh, environment, I think digital world and uh, physical world are inseparable. And uh, again, with the IoT, I think everything will be even more digital. And uh, if we look at the uh, greatest, this is by voting, so it's not a very uh, scientific investigation. Uh, if we look at the uh, uh, a survey about greatest invention in human history. There are many things. Uh, I think if uh, we have a, a physical crisis, uh, we have physical crisis. I asked for students about what you think. I think there will be a lot of uh, very uh, good answers on different things. But even with those, they are, at least based on the survey, there are three th things that stand out. Three things from far away in the past, to some time closer. I mean, the scale changes exponentially, okay? So th these are the logarithm uh, scale. So this is really far away. This looks close, uh, quite close to a far, but it, it is in fact quite close to the present, and this is the present. So because I, I, I maybe we don't ha have uh, opportunity to, to uh, interact, so I'll just show you the first one. Second one, third one. The first one is the wheel. Right? Humans are constrained by space and time. So the invention of the wheel allow us to expand our reach in space. Not just by ourselves. We have all the resources that we need to bring, need to transport. So having wheel uh, enable human to survive in in case of uh, different uh, uh, physical hazard, uh, environmental hazard, and allow us to travel in much shorter period of time to move resources in a much shorter period of time. So it has very significant impact to human civilization. The second one is uh, printing, printing machine. Without printing ma machine, the knowledge that this emanation of knowledge is through uh, a verbal or handwritten uh, uh, means. So the replication, the, dis the distribution of the uh, knowledge was very limited. Only certain people can have knowledge because they can they have books, they can read, and they they learn um, faster than other people. Where other people either learn from their, their parents orally, or they need to learn through experiences, which accumulate very slowly. But with the uh, printing technology, knowledge can be replicated very quickly, and, and the civilization start to progress a lot faster. A lot more people can be educated. A lot of people can learn through reading, uh, 
the history, the technology, or the earlier invention of human. So that also bring human civilization forward significantly. And in recent years, we all know that is the connectivity of a digital system from internet to World Wide Web. And World Wide Web essentially not only bring us a lot closer, very similar to the function of a wheel, allowing to break the barrier of the space. We can know what happens in an, the opposite side of the earth almost immediately, almost for free. So you can imagine what kind of impact it has created. In addition, all the knowledge accumulated by anybody in the world can be shared to World Wide Web. So all the knowledge can be shared almost immediately all over the world. And people start to search and these uh, data, this information started to be, to be processed and gradually becoming knowledge and shared by everybody. So why would really bring the world forward tremendously? All the change, this change is exponentially faster. So why would essentially combine the two key parts in, in the human history and even it is even more powerful than the previous two times. And Internet of Things is expanding the connectivity to the digital system. It is building up the connectivity in the physical world. Okay, I think for younger students, uh, you grew up at the time where we have OI work and the connectivity was there uh, when you were born and you were thinking that if not connected, what else? Uh, but the world was really uh, separated, right? The best that you can do was to call somebody, which was very expensive, or you can fax somebody, which was very cumbersome. Not everybody has that kind of tool until internet connected us. So the world from without internet to having internet, the world has been changed tremendously. Later, I probably can show you another slide. I think last year, it turns out, in terms of market cap, the, the biggest uh, companies in the world, uh, top 10 company in the world, six of them are internet companies, except for, for Apple. Those are not physical companies. Those companies basically only provide connectivity, Facebook, Alibaba, like Google, all these companies, or uh, Tencent from China. Uh, these companies, again, they only provide connectivities. They did not sell product per se. Well, uh, Amazon sell product, but Amazon own very minimum amount of product, and they are the biggest retail in the world. So, so you can think about that. I think connectivity is really the biggest um, innovation of, of, of mankind. And you can also think about individual. Doesn't matter how smart you are. If you are on your own, you cannot be connected with others. Uh, the best that you can do is based on your knowledge, your wisdom. Uh, I mean, you could be extremely smart, but you are very limited. For others, if they can access uh, internet, it, if they can be connected, they can have this collective intelligence and their learning can be shared uh, instantaneously with the rest of the people and everybody grow together, everybody move forward together. So that create this exponentially increased power that really empower mankind to advance very quickly. So connectivity is very important in in the digital world, we were able to connect the entire world, but basically it's through the system connecting the information provided by human. With IoT, we will be able to put in a nervous system in the physical world, collecting all the information, building up our understanding in greater detail about the entire world so that we can gradually finding better way to manage 
the system that we, we live in. So the reason that we can have IoT or the reason that we started with the, uh, with the, uh, the potential of using IoT was because uh, the technology advancement on the one hand, because of most law, whoops, sorry, because the most law uh, allowing to us to lower the cost. You can imagine that if we have a sensor or if we have a, an embedded system, it's just like a small computer, embedded computer. Uh, if, if you still remember uh, what most law is, it is every 18 months, the capability of the uh, uh, semiconductor system uh, will be improved. The capability will be doubled or the cost could, will be reduced to a half. So in 30 years, if you can do a quick computation, 30 years, it will be two to the 20th order. And two to the 10 is about 10 to the third and two. So it's just imagine that 30 years ago, a computer device cost 1 million US dollars. After 30 years, it's only one US dollars. One US dollar is exactly 1 million times cheaper. That's why we are able to have all kinds of tiny computers embedded in different places, helping us to do a lot of processing, providing information. We can also discuss about that. It can be, uh, uh, it has computing power, it has storage power, it has communication power, and it has also sensing power nowadays. So we have all of them everywhere so that we can facilitate the development of IoT. And if we look at the history of the IoT development, uh, it started from RFID. I will spend some time today talking about RFID. Okay. It's called radio frequency identification. Uh, later, I'll, I'll show that. So RFID is, was the beginning. And people, when people started, uh, people at MIT Auto ID Center developed uh, RFID chip and antenna. Basically, they, they want to put uh, electronic device on every object, every physical object, so that we can identify them uniquely. We can know what objects are in this room, what objects are passing by. We want to sense and know who they, who they are. So RFID was the beginning of IoT. In fact, they were thinking of RFID. They were thinking of identifying these objects and these objects were all connected with the internet. So they call it, in fact, although they also call, call it RFID, but they were, they were thinking that with the RFID on object, we will form this internet of things. So in the beginning, they were thinking internet of things were just, uh, was just a term describing when objects can be distinguished and they, they can be connected online to RFID, then we'll have Internet of Things. The first uh, Internet of Things conference was, um, was organized by ETH in 2008 in Zurich. Okay. At that time, there wasn't any other Internet of Things. There was only RFID but they have already called it uh, Internet, of, Internet of Things. Uh, but basically that was the history. Uh, uh, later, they, uh, the term was uh, developed even earlier, but they were mapping to, to RFID. But at the same time, there was also different development from uh, computer engineering department. For example, there was this uh, ubiquitous computing. There's this, Per, uh, per, per basic computing. Ubiquitous means that everywhere there's computing. It was a dream at the time. Everywhere there's computing power. There's a, there are a computer embedded in, in the wall, in, in, in the chair, in the table, in all kinds of devices. At that time, it was more like a, a dream. They were, they, they were imagining that they, we could have this kind of environment, but now 
we have already realized it. Pervasive uh, with similar meaning is, is, is everywhere in our environment. Ambient intelligence, I think th this term was also used quite, quite frequently, meaning that in the background, it's not the focus, it's not the computer there doing the computation, it's just in the background. We have lots of computing power, lots of uh, intelligence helping us to support our activities. Right? So it's, this is also a term that was uh, commonly used for similar environment. Also wireless sensor network, because for RFID or for internet of things, it cannot be wired. It has to be wireless. Without, without wireless technology, how can you put a sensor at a, say, at the door? And uh, for some, for passive RFID is still, still okay, but for others, you need to have power. And, and, and you need to have this wire connecting to, to other places, which is almost impossible. So, so wireless is, uh, is, is a very important part for uh, IoT technology. The wireless sensor network were built for, uh, for sensing purpose, but data, Basically, it became uh, a part of um, IoT too. They also talk about end to end, machine to machine, so that uh, it's, it's not man to, to machine or machine to man. In the past, man control machine and machine provide feedback to man. And man will make decision on, on how to move forward on the machine. But machine to machine allow machine to communicate among themselves so that they, can, they may be able to coordinate and resolve problems accordingly. That's also a very uh, interesting concept. So in the IoT system, there could be a lot of hubs until data reach the platform and being analyzed, being used by human. It's not human interven intervening every part of the, the machine. So that, that was also uh, the beginning of IOT. And then uh, wearable technology is more on, on the human. So on human, we have all kinds of wearable technology, sensing human activities, okay? And human, physical human bodies, human activities uh, are also very important of the physical world. So not just sensing cars, sensing temperature, sensing uh, air pollution, sensing solar irradiation, it's, it's sensing human too. And uh, similarly, with the ability to sense human, we can also provide uh, so-called smart health, uh, IoT-based smart health to help a human to manage their health better. And if you want to coordinate this uh, physical system with the digital system, or if we want to focus on more complex physical system, and make it more digital. We will turn this physical system, a cyber system. We'll have this, uh, and this, this term was developed by uh, Germany. Well, it has been used in other places, but in, 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 uh, for Industry 4.0, uh, an initiative of German government, uh, they consider cyber physical system uh, is the underlying technology of industry 4.0. That is making physical system a cyber system, okay? So physical manufacturing system now can become uh, a digital manufacturing system. We can treat a physical system more like we are treating services or application in the digital system. That, that will, I will, will cover later too. Okay, so industry 4.0 or cyber physical system um, is one very important, important part of smart manufacturing. We'll have uh, hopefully a, a separate uh, session to be discuss about um, smart manufacturing. So you can see these are uh, devices, right? This is uh, activity tracker. Uh, Google guesses, which, uh, which is not, use now because it looks too abrupt. Here there's a camera. So people consider that you are uh, you are 
a bit pervasive. You are intervening their, their, their lives. You are recording their activities. So it's not because of technology that uh, Google abandoned this. It's because that is too abrupt. The camera on your eyes and making uh, other people feel uncomfortable. So having uh, addressed, well, well, discussed a little bit about the uh, the basic, the history of uh, FID, uh, IoT. I think we, I will start from RFID to, to show you um, how what RFID is and what kind of application it can generate. And of course, there are more applications RFID can be applied. So, uh, but I uh, describe some basic RFID uh, applications, and and uh, hopefully that that provides you a sense that. Uh, what IoT means, okay? So RFID is, uh, is a technology where there's a chip, a very tiny chip. Like if you put your finger out, it's just a very small, like it's tiny. Uh, it's, it's like a, uh, a small stand like on your finger, fingertip. Okay, it's right here. And connecting to this uh, chip, there's antenna, okay? So uh, this is uh, the tag, play some object, and there are many different kinds of tag. And this, this is a so-called passive tag because it doesn't have power. So you, you have a reader, the reader will send waves and the antenna will convert the wave uh, into electricity and allow the chip to process the information and process the information sent along with, with the uh, electromagnetic field. And then after finishing the computing and use the remaining uh, electricity, convert them into waves and send it back to the reader. So the reader send and stir out, stir out the, the, the the uh, antenna and, and generate electricity and electricity. Again, there's a very minimum amount of, of uh, computing power. Basically it is just uh, for typical RFID text. It is just an ID, just a, a number. And the number will be sent back to the reader. So when the reader read, doesn't matter. Well, there's a still a limit, but it could be 10, quantities or, or hundreds of, of such kinds of tags in the space, okay? If we do it manually, or we use barcode scanner, or we, so we need to do it one by one sequentially. But with the RFID tags on everything, when the transponder send out the wave and receive the information, they have, they have the test. I think they can, um, in some of the reader, they can process 2000 texts simultaneous. So we can know what 2000 items in the space. So if you are doing a uh, logistic, you can imagine that you have lots of items in the past, you want to check one by one. Now you just need to use reader. If the text can be, can be read, you can know what exactly these items are. Right? And this information can be directly recorded in the computer system and the process subsequently. Okay, this is the RFID tag. There are many different kinds. This is a very basic uh, passive RFID tag. Uh, people are still developing RFID tag, trying to uh, further reduce the cost. Uh, I think globally, particularly in Japan and China, they are trying to develop this uh, one stand, one US stand RFID tag so that RFID can be more uh, popular uh, for the uh, adoption because it still has, doesn't matter how, how, how low the cost is, it's still a cost. Uh, if you compare RFID uh, technology with barcode, barcode is just printing. It has very minimum cost. But here, uh, right now, I think maybe it's 
definitely is be, be, a lot of tags can be below five US cents, but it's still too too expensive. Okay, so this is um, the function of RFID tag, and there are different kinds of RFID technology from low frequency, high frequency, ultra five, ultra uh, high frequency to microwave, and basically they have. Uh, I wouldn't get into the detail, but the point will be there's no uh, single dominating technology for RFID usage. You can imagine that when we are doing inventory counting, we want to have a reader reading a lot of text simultaneously. But if you are using something as um, I have now, it's our easy car, easy car. Easy car for, for taking public transportation, and we can also use it for purchasing. You probably don't want your easy car to be read too far away from where you hold it, right? So for this kind of application, it has to find some technology which can only be read uh, within short distance. But for, as I said, logistic and trying to, to know uh, what items are within certain space. Those kind of application, you'll probably use this ultra high frequency where you may be able to reach a uh, much longer distance. I think here, like two to seven meters. In fact, it can be even, even longer, okay. But for low frequency one, you have to be within 10 centimeters or even even closer, you can also adjust their power level so that um, uh, they they wouldn't read it for, for uh, read information from too far away. Okay, so these technology can be used um, can be used based on the kind of application that that you you will have, and they can uh, they, they have this uh, passive one, active one, active one they have power, okay, active RFID tech may have power. In certain application, you need to have powers. And in Taiwan, uh, uh, on highway, we have we don't have toll station, but we have this uh, ETC system where you have a tech, just simple tech, it's not a big device. It's just a RFID tech on the windshield of your car. When you drive to the GAN, uh, readers they will just read which car passing through uh, nowadays they even use it because they measure the, the the distance between these two uh location and if you pass these two location with with the amount of time too short then they will also give you ticket yeah. based on the uh the computation uh, unless you you are speeding otherwise you cannot reach the next point within such a short period of time so it was also used for this purpose. And, and ETC tag nowadays was also used uh, for parking because uh, in Taiwan, almost uh, all the cars have ETC. If you want to get onto, uh, you utilize freeway. If you want to move from one point, if you don't have ETC, then uh, you'll be, you have to have ETC, otherwise you won't be able to be charged. So they will take, Take a, a a a photo of your car and and, and give you a penalty. Okay, so it's just very simple. Being able to read, being able to identify what object it is, it has uh, already a lot of application. I will show you some more too. This is a uh, an example of RFID application for a specific product, and as I said just now. Uh, for different application, you will have different kinds of um, RFID tag. And here we have RFID tag for a bottle. So this is so-called item level tag. And usually what they'll do is you have traditional label. The label has a lot of words, so you can read them too, but for sure it's very slow. And they, they have barcode. If you don't want to read, at least if you have a barcode reader and if the, all the 
all the bottles go in the in the uh, or place in the right direction, you can still use a barcode scanner to scan individual bottle. And in fact, behind this, here there's a logo here. Behind this, behind this logo, behind two papers, there's RFID chip and antenna there. So you can utilize, if you can utilize RFID reader to check, for example, in this case, what are these uh, items, what these items are. If you can, you still have papers there, you can scan it. If you still can, you have, you can read the label. Okay, so there's this uh, uh, foolproof uh, system. Uh, but you can imagine that um, basically if you had this, you can only know that, oh, it's a certain product by Pfizer. If you scan the barcode, chances are you can only know what type of product it is. Maybe uh, a, a little bit more information. Okay, because the code is still not, not long. But for RFID, you can have a very long code. In fact, you can uniquely identify this bottle. You can uniquely identify this bottle so that you can imagine that in the, in the uh, product life cycle, it has a lot of potential application. If you can identify every single bottle of the product. Uh, but that is for maybe for security reason, maybe, maybe it is to prevent counterfeit uh, for other reasons. So every bottle, maybe it's for, for re recall. That is if a certain uh, batch has a problem, then you can quickly identify where these bottles are and recall them to quickly uh, uh, lower the, uh, the problem caused by, by, by the, uh, the problematic products individually. They can identify them. But for logistic purpose, you will probably put them in the box. And in the box, we, have, we can have a box level um, RFID text. As you can see, they still have words, uh, barcode, and RFID text. Here you can see the RFID text tag uh, clearly. And if you are putting these box, you stack them on a pallet, we just need to track the pallet then there's a, a pallet level text. You can see that they were designed differently for different applications. Their reading range, the way that they will read it will be based on uh, the, the design of the, the application. And these are different kinds of text. Um, I pass it text, usually they are contained by, by paper. So they are inside, they are not exposed to, to outside. They are smaller RFID text, which you, you can even inject to people so that whenever they come, if they under their skin, they can allow you to read. Uh, they are uh, metal text because antenna contains metal. If you put, put it too close to metal, then there will be interference. So they, they have this insulation from, from the metal. And they are this anchor kind of uh, tag. They are a soft tag and so on. So they, they are different kinds of tags and they were designed for different applications. Uh, different applications will have different reading constraints. And designing these antenna, uh, of course they are scientific part a lot of time, because it's quite complicated. So there's also um, uh, art. It is also an art to design the, uh, the uh, it require a lot of experience design, to design the antenna so that it can cope with specific problems, uh, environmental problems. For example, if you stack all of them together and what kind of tag you should have, if you don't want to read the, uh, if you don't want to be read by by another reader and try to make sure that they are separated more cleanly, and what kind of tag that you need to to use and so on, they are different design and the validation of such kind of uh, function need to go to uh, in a college chambers to test.
their their field to understand uh, whether or not they can be read properly. Okay, so this is uh, also RFID text. There are some applications uh, in logistics, you can use it. Uh, for wines, they can have text in, in the, the seal. So when people break the seal, they break the antenna. And, and when you want to check whether or not this is uh, an authentic wine, you will not be able to read the text. So either they were broken, which you don't want to buy, or they are counterfeit. So that's also quite helpful. And for a lot of logistics, uh, well, retail, they can use uh, RFID. And it, it was in fact Walmart, which promoted RFID tremendously. Because Walmart, you know that in terms of physical retail, it is the largest retail in the world. And uh, it's just grocery, basically. Grocery, the uh, profit margin for grocery is very low. So in order to ensure that they can still make profit, they want to make, make sure that the entire logistics process can be done extremely efficiently. And with RFID, they can do that, right? Remember I said that you don't need to scan barcode, which you require line of sight. And with RFID, uh, you can read them simultaneously. And with RFID, you can even identify individual item, like a unique item of the same product so that you can perform a lot more management on the, on the product. So they are, they were this, uh, uh, at the time they were trying to utilize RFID, but now uh, I think most of you will probably say that, ah, now I don't need to use RFID, I can use computer vision, which is true, okay? So at that time, computing, com computer vision may not be uh, possible because the computing power at the time was still not sufficient to process so much information in a very short period of time. Now, computer vision, uh, cameras are very inexpensive. Computing power can be accessed a lot more easy. And again, with deep learning, we can now use uh, computer vision to identify all of these items, okay? But still, if we want to track this unique product, computer vision still cannot deal with the problem. We still need to have a very long code to represent this unique product, then RFID can still be used. And for um, airline maintenance, for uh, uh, car manufacturing, airline maintenance is, they will have to, you can imagine that air, airplane is very complicated. You will do the maintenance, you will record the information, you will check the information. You have to do it very efficiently, otherwise you are losing your business. So they have RFID tag at different locations. And this location, you read the, the RFID tag, and maybe there are also information stored in the tag. You know when it was maintained at uh, which location also, or, and so on. Um, uh, sometimes they cannot connect online, so they need to store the information on the tag. And sometimes they, they don't know how they explain this specific location precisely. So they just read the RFID tag and RFID tag has this code and the codes can be used to search relevant information if they have backend system. So it is also used in uh, uh, aircraft maintenance. For, uh, for customized car, uh, basically they also have an active RFID tag on the car. So when the car is approaching, moving along the conveyor, line, it will communicate with the, uh, with the job shop at that location, requesting different assembly, different components to put on the car. And the workers with the skill uh, do not need to make their decision because the system 
has already read from the, the tag, understanding what the car needs and provide this information on the screen, guiding the worker to do the assembly and relevant parts can be provided simultaneously. I think more and more in manufacturing, they are utilizing RFID for the product so that the product has its identity right from the beginning. It's not an arbitrary car uh, for nobody until it's being sold. It's a car ordered by somebody with a certain kind of request and will fulfill the request by customizing the car. Okay, so RFID has the ability to uniquely represent the car and the communication of the product, the car with the system can be very smoothly because they can communicate digitally, wirelessly. Okay, so information can be recorded here on the active tag. Of course, it can also be recorded in the backend system, but we uniquely identify this car and uh, uh, which uh, and 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 which customers is is uh, ordering this car, then we can produce the, the car accordingly. It's also very important, and there are many different kinds of password verification, product uh, identification, inventory management. I mentioned personal identification, uh, just like my car, my uh, easy easy go car, uh, machine identification uh, in the hospital, you want to find where a specific uh, resource is. And maybe people took it to, to emergency room and you don't know where it is. Uh, so you can just use a reader to read and know where it is and go there to access the, uh, the machine. Uh, process tracking right, in logistics, right, this is a, a process tracking. And, and, and transparency, you know precisely what items are in the box, where they are, right? Otherwise, how do we know, right? Oops, sorry. Logistic tracking, transparency, anti-counterfeit, I mentioned about the wine. Lots of uh, product, like Levi Jets, uh, Levi uh, Jeans, Jeans also have RFID tech. It's for small retail uh, so that they can identify which gym has been uh, being checked by customer and so on, but they also know, they can also know that on the rack, uh, what gyms are still out there and uh, they can do very quick uh, inventory counting for the retail. And in this uh, active RFID tech, uh, we can also have this active semantic product memory so that it has all the information I described. That is describing what this product is, uh, what this product needs to be done and allowing it to communicate with the manufacturing system, even requesting resources from the manufacturing system to fulfill the needs of the product. It's a very different, different uh, it facilitates a very different ideas in the manufacturing environment. Again, it, it turns this passive product, no name product making process into uh, an active uh, named uh, customized product requesting resources to fulfill their needs rather than asking the no name product to meet the uh, process utilization of the system. So it's also a very core technology for industry 4.0. Uh, okay, so from IFID, we move on to uh, IoT. So IFID has a chip antenna putting on a product using wireless communication, allowing us to know all the items in the environment or if it, it is uh, attached to uh, a computing device, then we will know that that is a computing device. And the computing device along with RFID can, can send information back so that we know that machine sends certain sensing information back and we will utilize the information to 
device or application to cope with the situation. So the IoT ar architecture will be like this. At the terminal side, at right, the end side, we have a sensing layer. We have all kinds of sensors. Previously, we just have, for RFID, we just have chip with the ID and antenna. Now we have not just memory on the chip and the minimum computing power. We also have, uh, of course we have uh, wireless communication and we have sensing capability on the, on the end. So when it sends information back, going through the network layer, from local area network to telecommunication network or, or other network, we'll gather the information to the platform and, and with a lot of utility functions supporting uh, the plat these are basic uh, uh, application layer supporting all kinds of application. Okay, so you can imagine that I can put a sensor a sensor and RFID or without RFID on a specific uh, physical object. And the sensor not only report the, the, the status of the, the uh, physical object, the sensor can also serve as an observer, observer of the environment and providing this information and send it to the gateway through the gateway, uh, through the, the network and send it to, to, to platform. And on the platform, we can develop different, we can aggregate the data and supporting different kinds of application. For example, food category has a mitigation. If we are look, checking on the water level, if we are checking on the, the um, um, after the earthquake at different bridge, different building, whether or not uh, it's, it has a greater incline, maybe it's going to fall, right? Smart grid, which is uh, an area that we, we, we study uh, a lot, or, or intelligent transportation system, or tele healthcare. There are many applications can be de developed based on sensor at the terminal side. Right. could also be on, on human. And this information can, will be collected and sent to the platform. So outside, you, you've heard of a lot of people say, oh, we have IoT platform. It's basically the uh, cl cloud platform has a lot of utility functions supporting the data after they've been aggregated at the platform, allowing the software system or application system utilize those data to uh, to build out the model or to respond to uh, the situation, real-time situation accordingly. Okay, so on the platform, basically we need to aggregate the data, processing the data, allowing these data to be accessed and processed and, and uh, support different kinds of decision and application needs. Okay, so that's the uh, basic architecture of IoT. There's sensing layer, there's network layer, there's, uh, there's application layer. Sometimes they, they also show that it can be four layers or five layers, but I think uh, this should be clear enough. Right? Sensing to wireless communication, reach gateway and to whatever network and going to the cloud. On the cloud, we have different application that can serve. Uh, with IoT, in fact, there are new te technologies developed, not necessarily just for IoT, but definitely uh, different from what we had in the, in the past. One is uh, MEMS, we'll come, uh, come to this point. Microelectronic uh, mechanical system, okay? Very tiny physical system, mechanical system, but it is as small as electronic part. Uh, electronic components so that they can be combined together. And the electronic system can be sent, can sense the, the, uh, the conditions of the physical mechanical system. And so that 
uh, such kind of sensing capability can help us to sense the environment. Low power wide area network um, was developed mainly for, I, uh, for IoT application. Uh, as I said, IoT terminal size, if you need power, if you need powers, we want the power to be minimized as possible, as minimized as much as possible so that we don't need to replace the battery all the time. Okay? If we can do without sensor is even, uh, do without power, active power is even better. LP1 is a low, low bandwidth, long distance communication technology, allowing us just imagine that outside, we put hundreds of sensor outside. If we, all of them need to be connected, all of them need to use Wi-Fi. We need to have many access points, allowing them to connect, but the information could be very minimal. Every 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we'll send the data. We don't need to send, send, sense it sends the data like uh, 200 times per second that we can use LP1. So we can have this infrastructure covering, uh, I think it's uh, one kilometer uh, the radius uh, is one kilometer range with just one uh, base station. We can allow the information to be collected. That's in the ideal case, okay. So on campus, we, 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 we did a, a smart campus project. We only have just basically an, 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 a base station. And we try to send uh, all kinds of information to the station around the campus. Versus if we use uh, traditional uh, wireless communication technologies, we use Wi-Fi uh, wi or we use Bluetooth, we need to have many gateways before they can reach the network and send to the cloud. So LP1 uh, MEMS are just two examples of a new technology developed, uh, which are playing a very critical role in supporting uh, the application of IoT Internet of Things. Uh, so again, IoT architecture at the bottom, uh, at the terminal side is it provides the ability to sense anywhere. As you can put any place, basically. Um, still need some design and, and some, some modification, but you can do that. And they are connected all the time. Not like you send some people to do measurement and then that's it. They are connected all the time. You can get the data whenever you want the data. And these data will be aggregated together to support the service. The point will be um, better uh, collected information or more, more data uh, can, can, can support better decision. So these services, although we can have algorithm, uh, we have all kinds of functions, but without data, understanding what actually happened, our system cannot perform intelligently. It's just, just a mechanical system. Like, although it's software, it's a mechanical system. But with the data, we understand this, the situation much better so we can devise our service accordingly. So that's the cycle of IoT. The purpose will still be providing services, but you have to understand technologies a little bit of hardware technology, sensor technology, you need to understand a little bit about wireless communication, uh, networking. Uh, you have to understand uh, a little bit on the, on the platform and you have to understand how you can analyze the data so that different application system can utilize the data to provide better services. And again, MEMS, Microelectromechanical system, right? It's quite small, and you can see that within the uh, the mains, you can see this very tiny mechanical parts which per perform mechanical action. Uh, I can give you an example. 
For example, the car moving forward. When the car flip, okay, the car flip, it will trigger airbag. So how does the car know that the car is flipping? So, so inside there's a, a, a gyroscope, very tiny one, but there are pins. So when you, in a very short period of time, the pin move very quickly. So you know that the car is flipping this way, sideways, or rolling over, then the airbag should pop out. But when the car is turning left and right, it should be okay. So this rotating physical gyroscope, right, in the boat, it could be like huge. On the plane, it's still quite big. But here we have a tiny, tiny gyroscope interacting with the electronic system so that it, it makes connection with the digital system, electronic system, so that we can convert it, understanding the speed at which it's changing. And, and quickly trigger the, the action of the system to pop out the, uh, the airbag. Or when you are bumping into something abruptly, there's a plane moving very quickly. Again, the, the, the physical, the momentum of the physical object bringing this uh, ping quickly through the, 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 the sensor, allowing the sensor to know that in a very short period of time, the car has stopped abruptly and trigger the function of uh, um, uh, uh, different safety function, active function, including airbag to protect the driver. Okay, that's a combination of physical system, mechanical system, and electronic system. So MEMS is also a very important development in semiconductor manufacturing industry. I mentioned earlier that semiconductor uh, uh, industry used to produce computing capability computing chip, memory chip, communication chip. Now they also make MEMS, all kinds of sensing chip, sensing chip, uh, so that they can be combined together to, to support IoT devices and applications. So wearable technologies, there are all kinds of wearable technologies I, I'm human. Uh, lots of data can be tracked. I, uh, here, you can have something on your fingertips to control your, your presentations slide. You can move next page or do different things. And you can, you can put, uh, put, put like this band on your hands because whenever you move, your muscle structure will change. So you can teach the system knowing that you are doing what kind of gesture and you can control certain digital system. And there are uh, some other application that hmm, originally I was hoping to show you some, some video. Uh, I probably I can still do that. And this is a sensor putting on your, your uh, contact lens. It can, it can uh, detect your glucose level uh, to detect whether or not uh, your uh, sugar level is too low in your body. Uh, and so on. Okay, and this is a uh, this is also interesting. This is uh, sensing your brain wave to learn your command. Of course, you need to teach the system a little bit, but later you can just think and control the system. Okay, these are all simple uh, wearable technologies that have been around and providing a lot of services already. And these are uh, tattoo-like sensors. You can put them on your skin, it's friendly. And it has, uh, as you can see, antenna and sensor, right? So you can read it, right? Use electromagnetic field and generate electricity and provide the information back. The sensor, the information uh, uh, sensed by, by the sensor can be sent back to the reader. And you can put them on your skin. Uh, for example, here is a UV exposure. So you are under the sun too long and the sensor has already sensed that. And when you read, it will provide warning to you uh, to stay away from the sun. 
this is the perspiration um, with biochemistry uh, sensors so that it will sense again through your liquid uh, perspiration so that you will through the uh, biochemical process um, uh, making the uh, changing the conductivity so that the elect electronic system can communicate and if your again uh, sugar level is too high too low it can also sense and this is for hypertension or uh, the last one is for hypertension so you can put this simple uh, sensors on your, your skin and provide these uh, information so that it help you to to better protect your health condition I also saw them put this tag in the experiment on the heart of a pig so that the uh, piezo, piezo electric motion generate power on your pacer. So it's just like, just like a sticker put, putting on your heart and your heartbeat will generate electricity so that it will regulate your heartbeat and serve as a function of pacer. So otherwise, if you have pacer, you have to have a electricity. Uh, you have to have a battery. So after a while, you need to so open it up and replace the battery. But now with a similar kind of design that you can not only sense and regular the uh, situation and you don't have to have uh, power by yourself, you can use this energy harvesting technology to uh, sustain its, its capability. I think I will pause here. Um, let me maybe quickly show you a video. Give me uh, about five minutes. Uh, I will first, I have a few videos. I, I think I will show you next time, but uh, for this time. Okay, this is a case of RFID. It, it, it is in a mall and it is also combined uh, computer vision. So in the mall, there are many people walking inside the mall and they have RFID and, and camera combined together, vision combined together. So you see when they uh, activate the system, they will start to track people. So each person has an ID, okay? The ID will link to all the activities, all the purchase, all the frequency of uh, the frequency of of visiting uh, this mall and visit visit uh, certain shops, and people coming in, going out. They have the data. So up uh, top floor, the system was, wasn't activated, but ground floor is activated. Okay, it's active. Again, it's, com com it's not just the RFID, it's combining RFID and computer vision. So in the shop, you pick out an item. Oh, they know what you have already bought. So they know you and they know the items. They know the item you just, you, you, you just take out of the rack because there's a reader there too. So there are readers. Uh, in many places.
okay, just uh, to give you a sense of how RFID work, right? If you, you are in the environment, they can identify you. Uh, and if uh, all the objects having RFID, they can detect uh, based on their presence or they are not present so that they can uh, deduce certain behavior. And combining with a computer vision, they can combine individual people with their identify identification so that once these information are linked together, as I said earlier, the out of 10 uh, company with the largest market cap in the world, six of them do not deal with uh, physical product. They are dealing with connectivity. Okay, so such kind of connectivity will provide uh, potentially a lot of value. Okay, I, th I think I will stop uh, for now. Uh, and I yield the time back to uh, Rara. Thank you, Professor Cho. So is there any questions from the participants? Uh, you can raise your hands. So there is still no questions uh, in the chat. Let me check in the YouTube chat. Yes, there's still no questions or perhaps some of you willing to deliver the questions yourself to professor. Oh, there is one question. So I will read it for you, Prof. So it's from M. Aviv Hendrawan. How to prevent RFID overlapping in both the reader and the tech, especially in a manufacturing environment where fast data reading is required? Overlapping? Overlapping uh, in both between the reader and the tech. Is it, is, it, is, it pos is it possible? Uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, the words overlapping means in, in the mm -hmm. question. So for sure, there are many RFID texts in the space. So when you are reading, uh, again, as I said, that there were experiments which allow, uh, which they are doing this pressure test. Uh, 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 I think if I remember it correctly, it can simultaneously read. Uh, I think yes, they were testing like 2000 texts at the time. So, so uh, there can be many RFID texts in the same state and we can read them simultaneously. There, there are ways to separate their information. Right. Is that answering your questions? Uh, I'm Afif Hendra one. Is that clear enough? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, his uh, his meaning is a signal, the overlapping in signal because we need this fast data reading. So if there are a lot or a massive data that need to be read by this uh, reader, uh, how to prevent that signal overlapping? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think my, my answer was, was about that too. That, mm -hmm. that is, uh, the, the pre I, I couldn't explain the precise technology, but it, it is not an, an issue. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be able to read 2,000 texts simultaneously, you, you need to have uh, better readers. Uh, maybe you also need to have better texts, uh, but reading multiple texts will not be a problem. Uh, it is through their communication protocol. Yes, uh, so it is not an issue for the current technology of the right, right, right. Yes. right. You can, okay. you can imagine that if you are pushing, pushing a, uh, in fact, uh, that's a good question. I think there are two parts of um, testing. One is called static test. One is called dynamic test. Uh, static, te uh, static test is whether or not we can read it, re reading multiple ones, reading how many of them. Dynamic test is when, uh, when the objects are also moving. So we need to, if we are pushing a pallet through the gate, we need to make sure that while it's pushing, we can still read them. So there are uh, antenna 
uh, around the, the gate, they can, they can try to read the attack from the surrounding. Uh, for static test, we just test whether or not we can read under a static situation. For example, you are stacking all of them, a lot of boxes, and the tag could be on certain side. So we want to make sure that we can read it somehow, otherwise we'll miss that, that information. But reading multiple ones is not a problem. The problem is whether or not we, we will be able to read it so that the, the, uh, the interference or the, uh, uh, the blockage will not interfere the transmission of the signal. But uh, processing uh, uh, multiple text is not, is not a, a, a key problem in RFID technology or for wireless communication technology. That is through the protocol. Right. Okay. Thank you, Professor, for uh, the answers. Is there any questions? So thank you for the questions. Uh, I'm Afi Fendrawan. Hopefully that's uh, already give a clear answer. Any other questions? Right. So there is another question from Benjamin Limanto. Would you like to read it yourself? <laughs> manufacture of semiconductor will it be possible in the future all the computation are computed on the IOT itself or will they still relying on the big computation infrastructure to compute such as computer visions or other heavy computations especially if the IOT device is relying on the battery because there are a lot of jargon that run around such as edge computing but still not clear whether it will work as expected or not. Okay, I, th I think it's also a very good question. I think it's a, a key question. The development right now, um, well, originally you can imagine that having end devices being able to have powerful computing uh, capability is not, it, it's, it's going to be very costly and as you have already pointed out that it will consume a lot of energy. So that is why uh, uh, IFID technologies, uh, we have passive uh, technology, we have active. IOT technology, we try to have LP1 so that it doesn't need to uh, consume a lot of energy. We can send the information, less frequent information back to the server so that the server will do the processing for them. So that was the original architecture. But more and more, and also for more pre critical um, application, the communication will take time. Doesn't matter how fast it, it is. Although 5G claim that they have, uh, they, have they can have millisecond um, uh, latency, but that is only from, from the device to the station and you have to go to the network, you go to the cloud and finish processing and you, you go through the same process and back to the, the, uh, the, the application is not feasible, right? It's not feasible. So for certain application, for example, robotic sense, robotic operation, right? Any information obtained by, by the robot or the machining tool, you have to make decision immediately. In that case, they will send the data and they have, um, depending on how critical the application is, maybe they, they will have their edge computing. The edge computing can be on the device. Edge computing, computing can be done even at the, the, the tool itself, depending on how critical the, the, the latency is. So, so you're right that, um, for the end devices, we don't want to consume that, that much um, energy because it requires electricity. So, so cloud seems to be a viable solution. For many applications, it is done that way. But gradually, more and more when we use IoT technology, there are more and more problems that we want to solve. Those problems are very critical. So instead, 
we are moving gradually to edge computing because the computing costs at the edge are cheaper and cheaper. And besides edge computing, we also have, instead of cloud technology, we now have so-called fork technology, which is the infrastructure allowing us to smartly decide what operation should be done at which point. Maybe it's at the, the, the terminal side, right? at the end. Maybe it's somewhere in between. Maybe it is in the cloud. And the distribution of, of the work, workload may not be fixed. It depends on the loading of the network at the time, the loading of different devices at the time. So there's a system which helps us to coordinate these activities. But again, uh, if we can do them in the cloud, a very thing, thin uh, terminal uh, uh, devices, I think that will be preferable. However, for, for application with critical needs on latency, um, it has to be done on the edge. Right, thank you, Prof. Cho. Benjamin also have a second question. Okay. So is NFC same as RFID? Yes, it's similar. RFID usually we call them uh, RFID is because it is just an ID. You read the ID and take the information. NFC it is a communication technology. Okay, it's a bi-directional communication protocol, NFC. So you can design certain uh, control. Maybe you want to read and, and NFC will, will ask who you are. Then you provide the information to NFC uh, who you are. And NFC says, oh, okay, you have the access. I allow you to access and so on. This bi-directional. But RFID usually do not do that. RFID is providing ID maybe a little bit more information, but it doesn't, the protocol is not bi-directional. It's not a communication protocol. It's one directional mostly. But the principles are the same, right? Text and communication. And on the text, there's, a, there's also um, uh, a chip antenna and chip has more, more function, more powerful function. Okay, that's for NFC. Right, I think uh, other participants are also curious about this, the difference between NFC and RFID. Thank you, Professor Cho. Any other questions? So we still have time, uh, perhaps two to three questions. Thank you, Benjamin Limanto. Uh, your question is uh, very interesting. Any other questions from other participants? Right, okay, so there is one question from Indah Lestari. How can we know that the development of IoT will not violate someone's privacy? Because I saw from the video demonstration, in an era like this, data can be obtained by anyone. And I'm one of those people who feel less secure with the data that I have. Definitely, definitely. Uh... I think this is a there, this is an extremely important question, uh, and it's a big question. Um, in fact, there are two parts of the the question. One is privacy, okay. Physical world, your presence, your health condition can be measured. Um, if your health condition is not good, if people know that, if they don't want to give you a job, that becomes a problem, right? Uh, and uh, people may hack into, since you are it's a digital system, people may hack into the system. Right? So these are related to uh, privacy issues, security, cybersecurity issue. These are issues need to be addressed. There are a lot of people developing uh, IoT security issues, cybersecurity issues. Uh, in fact, we have been working with uh, 
Tokyo Institute of Technology, their School of Computing Science. Uh, we are holding this uh, intelligent IoT environment uh, annually, one year in Taiwan, one year in one year in, in, in NTUSC, one year in Tokyo Institute of Technology. Um, and we involve quite a few professors. Uh, some were working on say antenna design, reader design, but quite a few of them are working on IoT security. Okay, so preventing uh, IoT security is, is in fact quite difficult to, to maintain. Um, there, there are many ways, but, but basically that's a uh, cybersecurity an issue. Privacy issue is another issue. Um, so once people get the data, how can we prevent them uh, misusing the data? It's just like any other data that, that we provide physically or digitally, there should be a law. It, in fact, it's a very uh, important issue nowadays. Um, I'm also involved in a community about uh, data economy. You probably didn't think of data as something tangible, although people keep saying that, oh, data is a new mind. It sounds like a, a marketing sl slogan. It, it doesn't have any, any meaning, but it does have significant meaning. Data can really provide value. If you don't know your customer and your competitor know the customer very well, you won't be able to compete because they can come up with much cheaper, much more precise way of marketing product to the customers. They know who like this, who that, like that, and you don't. You don't really have the ability to compete them in terms of customizing your product, customizing your service to, to meet the needs of the, the customer. Okay, so, so data, privacy is one issue. Data ownership is another issue. Uh, you probably haven't thought of something called digital sovereignty. Digital sovereignty. Like we have physical world, we have digital world. In fact, for most of the, the countries, our we don't have digital sovereignty. In the digital world, it's all like this major company solution. They are taking all of the data out of your country. Like they are utilizing the, those data to create product, to create maybe sometimes uh, to their advantage, service and digital product to your citizens. But you don't have sovereignty. They are selling product to their digital system in your country, but you cannot tax them because they are abroad. So digital, digital sovereignty is a major issue for every country. They need to understand that in the digital world, there are a lot of things they still need to govern. They need to protect, protect their citizens, partic particularly on the data ownership, not just privacy, data ownership of the citizen. So similarly, IoT data, once the IoT data can be attained by others, uh, if companies are using, using it to provide better services to you, probably you'll just allow them to use the data. But unfortunately, most of these data uh, in the beginning will be used for providing some service in exchange of the data. But then a lot of cases, these data will be misused to provide advantage for the companies to provide advantage over you because there's uh, this information, uh, SM, asymmetric information so that they can provide different kinds of services and different kinds of uh, process so that they can take advantage of their, their customers. That, that does happen. So, so in the digital world, there are, there are such things happening already with the IoT connecting physical world, if we are not careful, then the physical world can also be influenced. Okay, so again, 
I only, I, I, I only provide you this um, like very vague uh, answer. But I'm, I'm saying that it is a big problem. It is a big problem. And globally, including Taiwan, we have different researchers trying to deal with IoT cybersecurity issue. We have uh, uh, law professors and, and like people like me who are concerned about uh, uh, digital, uh, the safety of digital system. We are looking at uh, um, uh, data economy, uh, digital sovereignty, uh, data ownership, data ownership, which is really important. How does Google make money? Google make money out of advertisement, selling our information to other companies. In the beginning, when we have emails, our email were analyzed. Now we know our email were still analyzed. Otherwise, they, they won't be a lot of hints saying that, oh, do you want to have this on your calendar? Do you want to do this at that? They were analyzed. So once they analyze us, like customer, like the, it's not our research data Google is interested in. It's what I, as a consumer, is more interesting, is more valuable. So it is our behavior. We are customer, we pay money to buy product, which triggers the entire supply chain. So knowing us, is extremely valuable. So don't data ownership, uh, our data in, in Google, our data in Facebook, I just say, you spend your life in, in Facebook and Facebook utilize your information, uh, analyze your information. Facebook now claim that they know you better than you do yourself. They sell such kind of information to product companies and product company, you, you, a product company use these uh, online companies, their connectivity to, uh, to, 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 to market their, their products and to provide still services to you. And those are your data. They have utilized your data. Now, if there's a new company, say in Indonesia, they provide very good service but they require your data. Your data, which were collected by, by Facebook for many years, and they need that data to provide service to you. And that service could be beneficial to you. Right now, if you ask Facebook to transfer your data to this company, it's not going to happen. But those are your data. Those are really very valuable data. It's, again, it's not your research, my research, I, my reading is my behavior, my interest, my business value. So those data should be able to be transferred to, to local companies and allowing these companies to provide service to you because those are your data, but that cannot be done. So these big, bigger company will dominate the market because they hold your data already. And there's no way that you can add value to those data because they will not allow these data to be used by others, create new competition for them. So there are a lot of issues in, in the digital world. Um, I mean, maybe later we still have opportunity to discuss them. Uh, it's good that uh, some of you have already uh, notice that there's a big threat in the system. Uh, our current information system, our digital system has a lot of problems, which we know already. Uh, with the physical system connected digitally, and once they are digitally and they have wireless communication, there are chances that they can be hacked. They can be planned on malware, all these problems. Uh, they need to be addressed for sure. And there are a lot of people doing that. Uh, there's no unique solution. We are only better than those hackers which cannot hack us. <laughs> Once they can hack us, then we need to find different ways to, to prevent their hacking. 
there is an endless war. Like there's no ending of the war. Uh, uh, but, but there are many researchers like dealing, dealing with this issue. Uh, how do you authenticate the sender, which use PKI mechanism, like, which can be done already. Uh, in, in, uh, in IoT system, uh, there, IBM consider IoT and blockchain are a good combination. So blockchain has, uh, has certain functions. One of them is utilizing this uh, cryptography and also uh, something like, like PKI system. So, so when you have an IoT system, you allow M to M. You have a sensor sensing information and sending to this device. The device will react accordingly. But how do you know it is that device sending you information? How do you authenticate the sender? How do you authenticate the, the information? Right? So if you remember PKI, you can utilize PKI system to uh, authenticate a, a sender. Or if you want, you have a IoT device at the end and you need to upgrade your firmware. Uh, traditionally, you need to go to a secure site to download the firmware. Now you can still use a uh, uh, function that blockchain uh, uh, contain, but it is also more like PKI system, right? Or, or uh, um, hashing system, right? So, so as soon as you can get the, the, the hash key, uh, whatever software provided to you, firmware provided to you, you can generate its hash, hash number, then you can compare. If they are identical, you know that this particular uh, firmware has not been tempered. There are just a lot of ways that people were, do, were trying to do to, to secure the, um, the, cyber, the secure the uh, IoT, but again, there are still a lot of people trying to hack into the system. Recently, uh, the server of our lab was hacked. It's a, they are requesting, this, that was a ransomware. So they request Bitcoin before they will send us. But, but because uh, it wasn't that good, so one of our lab members was able to try different, for, for, I don't know how he did it. Uh, uh, he tried different, different, different um, key. Eventually he was able to decode that so that we, we did not pay the ransomware. Okay, Prof, I'm really sorry to hear about the <laughs> lab, but it has been solved. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So that is uh, the concern from Indah Lestari about the uh, data privacy. And Alif Aditya Wicaksono also have the same concerns and you already uh, answered that and the explanation is very clear. Thank you. Right, uh, I think the time is up, uh, but because this is the first lectures, if there is one, one question, one last question, anyone? No questions? One oh, One question. Okay. No? I hear someone. Thank you, Prof. Cho, uh, for today's session. Uh, You're welcome. You're welcome. Every yeah. day, Prof. Cho is always healthy. Uh, we will meet next week. <laughs> yes, yes. We will meet next week. Uh, I think students ask very good questions. Okay. But the, those are very big questions, very big questions, uh, very key to the future development. Just that it will take a lot of time to, to go to all the detail. Very good question. All right. Uh, so I will give a quick uh, summary what we have learned today. So we know about Internet of Things, especially the technology technology of RFID and MEMS as well. And then the IoT architectures, uh, we learn about the wearable tech, especially that. That's really interesting about the temporary tattoo stickers with the sensors. Uh -huh. Perhaps uh, Professor Cho can give a hint what we'll, we'll learn for the next uh, session. Uh, 
Okay. So next week I will uh, again go through a little bit of the uh, basic technology and I will start to go into um, different uh, application. And I will also show you some videos which I collected about IoT uh, application. I think um, again, uh, next week, uh, I will talk a little bit about some transportation application, some health application and some retail application, smart retail application, so that you are more aware of the, the simple application. So gradually I will take you to the, uh, uh, to the adoption also with the uh, blockchain and uh, deep learning so that we can have a full cycle of IoT. Again, IoT, if we think of it as just uh, as an infrastructure, it is just data collection, but that's not the, the goal. If you think of IoT as a system, it should have the ability to do analysis to, to make sure that the data integrity can be maintained and then it can be analyzed in depth so that we can utilize data to support decisions. Right. So, so I will also, uh, well, next week I'll continue to talk about IoT application and gradually I'll move to, to um, a little bit on blockchain and, and, and AI, uh, particularly on deep learning. Then we'll look at uh, subsequent application, for example, smart manufacturing and that smart energy and those applications will be more complicated. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Cho. So there are still more interesting topic for the next session. So please make sure to join again next Thursday at the same time, 3.15. Uh, do you want to add some, uh, Professor Erma, perhaps? No, I think just want to make sure that for the next week, we will have IoT application region for the topic. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. IoT application. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much, Professor Cho and Buraras. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, I will close this uh, class with the tagline from the I IoT architecture service intelligently, connect anytime, sense anywhere. <laughs> uh, we will take a picture. So please uh, turn on the video and then I will uh, make a screenshot from the participants today. Maybe Professor Ruchu can stop your screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Right, so I will start from the first gallery. Uh, smile in one, two, three. Right, next one. So we have uh, more seven. than <laughs> yes. we have seven pages. <laughs> Please smile again for the second one, two, three. Okay, next the third one. You can turn on the uh, video and uh, you can put the background of a, a Chang professor as well. In one, two, three. Let me check for the next. Okay, I think that is all. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Cho. Thank you very much, Buraras. Pak Muja, thank, thank you. you very much, Mas Indi. Thank you, yeah. Pak Mujahidin, Pak Indi, Prof. Thank Erma, you. Prof. Cho. Okay. Okay. See, you you okay. See, you See you next time. See you next week. Yeah, thank okay. you. See you next week. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay, bye.